Okay, so today's gospel comes from John. This might be a surprise to you because we've been saying we're going to be studying Mark. But Mark is short, and uh, John sneaks in there in the lectionary that we use, in the, in the readings that we use. So we have this passage from John, and you will find that the season of Epiphany is a season in which we talk about calling. And, uh, and you'll hear some call stories this week and next week as well. So hear this from John. This happens uh, very early. This is immediately after Jesus' baptism, where the dove comes down and uh, says that this is God's beloved. Follow him. And uh, this happens the next day. So here we go. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, I missed you last week um, while I was uh, unfortunately bound by warm temperatures and uh, pools. Um, yeah, I, I listened. I heard that you prayed for me, which I really appreciate. It was one of those prayers that comes with sort of a double-edged tone to it. But uh, I'm grateful for any prayer. Thank you, actually. So, uh, yeah. And where was I? Um, I was at the fourth installment of a program called the Next Generation Leadership Initiative. Uh, and this is a program from my denomination, the United Church of Christ, that uh, is designed to help uh, engender in young leaders um, ability to, to lead faithful and fruitful congregations. Um, and I have shared some learnings from that each year. This was my fourth and final year of getting to go to this resort in Arizona, um, but also to have this kind of learning, and the remaining six years of the program will be self-directed study. Um, the, the theme of this capstone year was leading faithful and fruitful churches. Uh, and there were lots of things that we talked about in that, but there were a couple that felt that they were really relevant and that I wanted to make sure that I shared with you all. One of the things they talked about was what makes a fruitful church? Now we have some scriptural evidence, any of you who uh, have this song in your head from Vacation Bible School that can run ad nauseum, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Yeah, you're welcome. That will be your earworm. Um, thank you, Elvira, for prompting. Excellent. Well done, Gold Star. Um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Um, okay, fine. How does that translate into church? Uh, one of the things that we talked about is what are the ways that you know that a church is really doing what it needs to do to share God's love with people? I wonder if any of you have ideas about that. If you do, and you're feeling bold, shout them out. What, how would you know that a church is fruitful and faithful? It's tough, right? It took us a minute. Collecting money for the worthy beyond themselves. So sharing of their resources, yeah. Social outreach. Social outreach. You feel welcome. Respect and love for all individuals. Respect and love for all individuals. Maybe even get criticism about others. 
maybe even earning some criticism among others. <laughs> Taking some risks. Talking it through when there's a problem. Not being afraid of conflict. Yeah. Growing. Growing, yeah. A loud voice against A loud voice against injustice and tending your neighbor. Tending to your neighbor, yeah. So these are some of the fruits. This is very, this is an excellent list. Um, we added to that two, um, finding depth of spiritual relationships with God and with each other, um, finding ways to connect personally, one-on-one, -on -one, and to deepen community ties. But all of these things, I found, were really inspiring reasons to be a church on a day when it starts out at two degrees. Um, to be able to gather together and to work on these things. One of the things we talked about was how God raises up the ability to do these things by training disciples. Disciples are not just made. They are grown. They are nurtured and developed. And they are developed in community. So you have examples from the gospel of Jesus calling people, and they're, they're kind of random people. I mean, you know, they're kind of people who are not ideal. Um, fishermen, folks who may not have the best communication skills, folks who come from the other side of town, like Richmond. <laughs> Or Berea. <laughs> Folks who may come from places that their leaders might issue crass remarks about. And Jesus calls them. Those are the ones that Jesus picks. They're from the nowhere places. They're from the outskirts. And they're not particularly skilled. They have to spend years with Jesus just practicing. And you'll know as you go through the Gospels, they do not get it right all the time. You go through, poor Peter gets the bad rap on this all the time. He's really good at risk-taking. And he goes and he acts boldly and then he gets smacked down. You did not get that right yet. Keep practicing, young Jedi. <laughs> Keep learning. The disciples that God calls are grown into people who know God through practice, who know God through showing up and following and continuing in the journey. And in that process, they are challenged throughout the gospel stories to follow in even greater ways, to follow not just because they feel known and welcome, but also because they are hearing a call to do greater things, to see a wider vision, to see heaven itself break open in a new way. And they are called to risk in order to do that. Every one of them has to face a difficult time. And yet they are willing because they have grown over the years with Jesus in that way. We have a similar story in the calling of Samuel. This is one of my favorite stories uh, because I always felt really, you know, empowered as a kid to learn this story. That a little kid got to be called and was the one who was like, oh, Eli, you going down. <laughs> now that I'm a little closer to the age of Eli, um, I see the story differently. I see the story as one of a church leader being willing to take the risk to let young people hear the voice of God and to let young people teach and show, even when it's not always in our best personal interest, out of faith and trust that God is good and that all that God does is good and that if children challenges, challenge us, it is not something to be afraid of or to smack down, but to listen to as God doing a new thing. These two stories of call, and you'll hear some more next week, I think show the way that God surprises us constantly, right? God is always picking weird and unusual people to bring God's word. But an interesting question is, why doesn't God just tell Eli? 
Why doesn't God just guide the disciples to do the right thing? It's this strange mystery that God seems to value above doing the right thing, the value of community. It's one of the most powerful, uh, powerful metaphors when we talk about the Trinity of God. It's God in community. It's God refusing to just be God's self, but also to be Jesus, also to be the Holy Spirit, also to be moving and transforming all the time throughout community. I think what we hear from these stories of God calling misfits and strange people is that God sees that each one is, as it says in Psalm 139, fearfully and wonderfully made, blessed with gifts of God, and blessed with the ability to help others, whether they're older or younger, wiser or not as wise. And God also challenges each of us, like Eli, to grow as we mentor others. So one of the focuses of our leadership program was to think about how we build up leaders in our church. The question that they asked us was, when was the first time someone trusted you with leadership in the church? And I think if you could think about this for yourselves, it may be that that was a place for you in the church. It may be that you were trusted with leadership in some other way. But take just a moment and think about when were you first trusted with leadership? And if any of you would like to share, very brief, uh, a time that you were trusted. As a member of church council when I was um, in high school. As a member of church council when you were in high school. member of the ecumenical youth in Denver. Ecumenical means lots of denominations together. Teaching preschoolers when you were 12 years old. These stories are similar to what we heard in the leaders that went around our room. There were 16 of us, and almost to a one, we were first trusted with leadership as youth. We were first trusted to do something that seemed beyond our capability as very young people. But some were trusted later, and the same story applied. That you were given a challenge to do something greater than you thought you could, but also that it was successful because you were supported. Because you had people that walked alongside you, helped you to know what to do, and gave you the strength, but also let you do it, also let you mess it up, also let you be a disciple. One of the things that they gave us as a tool was sort of a four-step process of growing people in ministry. And this is where there, and there's a leader and, say, a mentee, or a mentor and a, and a mentee. So in the first step, the mentor invites the mentee to just come along, come and see, come and see what we're doing. The second step, the mentor invites the mentee, this is confusing, to come along and try a little bit. The third step, the mentee is the leader and the mentor helps out. And the fourth step, the mentee leads, and the mentor is there just to nod and give support. And it's this gentle process of growing up leaders and giving them more and more capability. One of my classmates shared a story about Handy Andy, the guy that was in their church. Uh, this church grows, uh, or not grows, but has bees. They keep bees and they sell the honey as their uh, church fundraiser. They're in Vermont. They're part of CSAs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so Handy Andy will train anybody who wants to learn on beekeeping. And he will do that exact process. He just knows it because it has been taught to him. And in doing so, they find that they're able to share their faith with one another in a less intimidating and more useful way. This kind of leadership development can be formed in places like Stephen Ministry or other formal ministries. But it also just happens when we as a community are willing to get together and ask each other for help. 
Now that is the challenge, right? That asking for help and that being willingness, willing to help. Just this morning, Kent called me out on this when I was going to go cut all the things for the, the altar and he said, could somebody else help you with that? And it was a very helpful question. <laughs> Because it's hard sometimes not to forget that it'll just be faster if I just do this, right? But there's a hubris in thinking that I can do it all. And it usually means that things are not done as well, even if over the long term they're not done as well. They might be done right in the moment, but long term it's not as sustainable. So I think this kind of building up of leadership, like Eli's experience, requires some humility requires some ability to allow the mentee to challenge and to stretch the mentor. And maybe to go where things haven't been done before in new ways. The miracle, though, of the discipleship model of people mentoring one another is that it multiplies the good news. My, my uh, instructor said that Jesus was the inventor of the pyramid scheme. So he brings together a couple disciples and they get a couple disciples and they get a couple disciples and everybody's training everybody else and suddenly you have a good news movement that's offering grace to thousands of people. You can't do it as one person, but you can do it in community. One of the most powerful ways that we see this happening is in the civil rights movement. The ways that SNCC and all the other organizations trained up people, Highlander Center, you know, got people together, said, here is what we're going to do, and we're going to go and do this together. And one powerful story of this is the story that Bob Schaefer shared this week that I want to share with you of how the civil rights movement empowered him to become an empowering leader. So these are Bob's words. If it were not for Martin Luther King Jr., I would never have come to Kentucky to work or live. It began in the summer of 1964. From our home in Haddonfield, New Jersey, I called my father in Williamsport, Pennsylvania to tell him I was planning to go to the March on Washington in August. To my surprise, he said he would like to go. We had never done anything like this before. We agreed to ride down together in a chartered bus leaving from Williamsport. As we rode, we discussed the possibility of, that the demonstration might turn violent, considering the injustice experienced by blacks since the days of slavery. Soon after getting on the bus, such fears quickly left us. Buses came from all directions, unloading their passengers, black, white, Hispanic, American Indian, men, women, children, people from the Bronx, Chicago, Atlanta, I especially remember the young people in their bibbed overalls from Mississippi, Georgia, and Alabama, and elders who never expected to see anything like this in their lifetimes. There were banners identifying groups of marchers, the AF of L, the CIO, the auto workers, churches, Berea College. Everyone seemed happy, expectant, sensing as the number grew that this was going to be a historic occasion. I had never seen a gathering of 250,000 people before, or so many African Americans in one place. There was music, there were speakers, but the crowd never settled down until Martin Luther King began to speak. Then there was complete silence, interrupted only by applause and shouts of approval. I can still recall the sound of his strong baritone voice describing the vision he saw for this nation. Then and there, I decided to do all I could to help make that dream come true. When I returned to our home and Presbyterian church in Glassboro, New Jersey, I set to work. I organized an interracial human relations council and actively pursued issues like fair housing and equal access to recreational facilities. Our church exchanged choirs and pastors with black churches. During this time, I learned that the United Presbyterian Church USA was recruiting ministers and elders to go to Mississippi in the spring of 1964 and reach out to Southern ministers and to support blacks who were attempting to register to vote. As chairman of the Church and Society Committee of the Presbytery, I put out the word. One other minister decided to go with me. Upon arrival in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, a cab took us to an empty store in the black section of town. Cots were set up all around the walls. A leader explained our mission. 
We were to spend time each day walking back and forth in front of the courthouse to give moral support to the blacks who were entering in an attempt to register to vote. The risks to those who attempted to register were considerable. As they arrived and we demonstrated on the sidewalk next to the street, men in pickup trucks drove slowly by and shouted obscenities. At night, we attended rallies in black churches in town and out in the country. I will never forget the testimonies of those who had lost their jobs simply for attempting to register. People whose lives were threatened, people thrown out of their homes, people, plain people, hardworking, courageous, joyful. The singing was unlike anything I had ever experienced. After our two-week assignments were up, we returned to New Jersey. Two months later, we learned that bodies of three young men had been buried in an earthen dam in a county 100 miles north of Hattiesburg. They had been murdered for doing the same things we had tried to do. Upon returning to New Jersey, I was more determined than ever to do all I could in the struggle for justice. After the passage of the Economic Opportunity Act in 1965, I encouraged the Human Relations Council to apply for a Community Action Agency grant. The state agency coordinating the war on poverty decided they wanted larger, multi-county agencies rather than one serving a single community. Because we were familiar with the application process, I was asked to organize an agency including Salem, Cumberland, and Gloucester counties covering much of southern New Jersey. The grant was approved and they were on their way. We were on our way. Later that summer, I was told a new program was being initiated that might interest me. The Special Technical Assistance Program would hire 20 special assistants from across the nation to be assigned to serve on-site or one of, the, of one of the more, sorry, serve on-site one or more of the 100 poorest counties in the United States. They said we were looking for someone to work in the Cumberland Valley area of Eastern Kentucky an area that included two of the 10 poorest counties in the nation. I said I was interested and would let them know. I went to the college library in Glassboro and providentially found Harry Cottle's Night Comes to the Cumberlands. I called Washington and told them I would accept the job if they would send me to Kentucky. They agreed and early in October I went to DC and after a one week orientation arrived in a motel in Berea ready to go to work. Four years later, the Nixon administration ended the Special Technical Assistance Program, and we returned to New Jersey. As you heard when we lit the justice candle, the rest continues to become history. In 1988, Bob retired and he and Carol moved to a farm in Estill County. And having learned so much in his organizational background, he went on to organize and chair the Estill Development Alliance, which successfully managed to deter a major oil company from dumping radioactive soil into the Estill County landfill. And today, he continues to fight for the rights of the people in Estill County to be protected from used as a dumping ground, being used as a dumping ground for chemicals from fracking and other industries. Bob's story is an amazing one. But it is, yes, it is. But it is not so different from the potential that each one of you could have. It is one of saying yes. It is one of being willing to see what the next right step is, of following your heart, but also one of being led. And for some of you, that is the call today to lead others, to recognize the gifts that you see in one another, to mentor, to train, to challenge people with something greater than they could have imagined, to provide continued inspiration and sustenance, and to teach and lead others to pick up that mantle and walk forward another step. I'm saying all this today because I know that I'm about to leave. I know that my leaving will leave some holes, and I know that we're already struggling with a few holes in the leadership in our church, finding people who are wanting to fit a particular leadership area. And it may be that our structure needs some revisioning in that, and I know that there are plans in place to begin thinking about what that might look like. But it may also be that what we need to do is work together as community to raise up leaders, 
to help dispel the fears of taking on too much, of not having the skills, of not being enough, of not being worthy, and instead to point out the gifts of one another and to nurture and to love into service. What Jesus promises in the Gospels is that this is worth it, that there is greatness ahead, that there is wonder and delight, heaven even, and I have great faith in what this church has the capability to do. And so my challenge to all of you today is to find someone to go alongside of you as mentor, mentee, companion on the journey. Maybe accept a leadership position. Maybe decide today is the day you want to join this church and pledge to work in service with one another. To issue trust and challenge at the same time. There's a quote on my wall in my office, and I put it as your meditation today, of what Howard Thurman suggests is the way to find your call. The place where, oh, now I've forgotten it. <laughs> Give me that thing. <laughs> Ask yourself what makes you come alive, and do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And so maybe there's a place that you are calling, being called to life, being called to abundance, being called to leadership? If so, let yourself answer it and bring someone else along. Amen.